Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for General Chemistry 1. In the last video, I mentioned that there are three basic types of chemical reaction. These are precipitation reactions, acid-base reactions, and reduction-oxidation or redox reactions. And almost every chemical reaction belongs to one of these three categories. So if you understand them, you'll be able to understand a lot about all kinds of reactions that you'll see in this course and in every chemistry course you ever take. In the last video, we talked a lot about precipitation reactions. So in this one, we'll tackle the second category, acid-base reactions. These are among the most important reactions in many biological systems. And if we understand how acid-base reactions work, we'll be able to perform many of the most important calculations that chemists do in their daily work. By the end of the video, we'll even understand enough that I'll perform what could be a risky experiment Will I end up dying as a result? Probably not, but I'm recording this audio before I actually do the experiment, so you never know. Watch to the end of the video in order to find out how it went. So let's start by talking about acid-base reactions. In an acid-base reaction, the two reactants are an acid and a base. That seems super obvious, but we should stop for a minute and ask, what exactly is an acid or a base? This is actually a harder question than you might think. In the second semester of general chemistry, we'll give that question a really deep look, but for now, I'll just give you a simple answer. For the purposes of our discussion today, we'll just say that an acid is a compound that produces a hydrogen ion, H+, in water, and a base is a compound that produces a hydroxide ion, OH-, in water. As I said, this isn't a very good definition, and you'll learn a better one during the second semester, but we're not quite ready for that yet. The definition I just gave you does describe all the acids I asked you to learn way back in the fifth video. For example, one common acid is nitric acid. If you have nitric acid molecules in water, the molecules dissociate to produce H plus ions and nitrate ions. By our definition, that's what makes nitric acid an acid. It produces those H plus ions in water. By the way, this property also helps explain the way acids behave. Most people know that acids are corrosive, and that's because H plus ions are very reactive. When something dissolves in an acid, often what's happening is that it's the H plus ion that reacts with it. In the same way, suppose we put sodium hydroxide, which is a common base, into water. The sodium hydroxide dissociates into sodium ions and hydroxide ions. And by our definition above, that makes sodium hydroxide a base. So now let's get back to the actual acid-base reactions. Suppose we combine an acid and a base. For example, nitric acid and sodium hydroxide. What will we get as a result? If you watched the previous video, you might remember that many chemical reactions are what we call double displacements, which means that the cations in the two reactants will switch places. The acid-base reactions we'll look at in this chapter will all be double displacements. So in this example, the cation in nitric acid is the H+, and the cation in sodium hydroxide is the sodium. So the hydrogen will pair up with the hydroxide and the sodium will pair up with the nitrate. So what does that mean our products will be? The sodium ion has a charge of plus one, and the nitrate is minus one. So we just need one of each in our product, which makes sodium nitrate. In the same way, the hydrogen has a charge of plus one, and the hydroxide is minus one. So we just need one of each of those. But notice what that gives us. If we combine a hydrogen and a hydroxide, we have two hydrogens total and an oxygen, H2O, that's water. In fact, for the acids and bases we'll see in this chapter, that will always be true. The acid will always produce an H+, and the base will always produce hydroxide. So one of our products will always be water. The other product, sodium nitrate in our example, is called a salt. In ordinary life, when we say salt, we usually mean table salt, NaCl. But in chemistry, 
A salt is just an ionic compound that can be formed by combining an acid and a base. So in this chapter, the products of all our acid-base reactions will be water and a salt. Let's try another example. Another common acid is sulfuric acid, which you might remember has the formula H2SO4. We'll combine that with the base potassium hydroxide, KOH. What will we get? Well, we know it's a double displacement reaction again, so we need to exchange the two cations. The hydrogen will pair up with the hydroxide, and the potassium will pair up with the sulfate. As I just said a minute ago, the hydrogen and the hydroxide will combine to give us water. But what's the formula for the other product? Potassium has a charge of plus 1, and sulfate has a charge of minus 2. By now, you should have learned the charges on that list of polyatomic ions I gave you several videos ago. You can see that these are becoming more and more important, so if you haven't learned them by now, please try to do that as soon as you can. Anyway, we see that we'll need two potassium ions to cancel the charge on the sulfate, so our formula will be K2SO4. As I said, acid-base reactions in this chapter will always produce water and a salt, so the salt in this case is the potassium sulfate. The last thing we need to do is balance the reaction. You might have noticed that the potassiums, hydrogens, and oxygens are all unbalanced. As I mentioned in a previous video, the atoms in a polyatomic ion, like hydroxide, are usually harder to balance, so it's smart to try balancing those last. That means we'll start by balancing the potassium. To do that, we'll just put a coefficient of 2 in front of the potassium hydroxide. Now that we've done that, we should balance the hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen is only in one molecule on the right side of the equation, but the oxygen is in two different molecules on each side, which means that the hydrogen will be easier to balance. So let's do that one next. There are a total of four hydrogens on the left side, two in the sulfuric acid, and one from each of the potassium hydroxides. On the right side, there are just two hydrogens. So to balance them, we need a coefficient of two in front of the water. Now that I've done that, it turns out that this reaction is balanced. Changing the coefficient on the water actually balanced the oxygen for us as well as the hydrogen. So now there are a total of six oxygens on both sides of the reaction. One of the things we're especially interested in when we deal with acids and bases is their concentration. As you might guess, a concentrated acid or base is much more powerful and corrosive than one that's very dilute. The important thing to know is how much acid or base is in a given volume of our solution. In other words, how many moles are there in a liter of solution? This is such a useful quantity that it gets its own name. The number of moles of a solute divided by the number of liters is called the molarity, which has the symbol of capital M. The concentration of any solution can be measured in molarity, not just acids and bases. For example, suppose we dissolve 30.00 grams of sodium chloride in enough water to get 250 milliliters of solution. What will be the concentration of that solution? The concentration is the molarity, which is the moles of solute, divided by the liters of solution. So, the first thing we need to know is how many moles of NaCl we have. We get that by taking our 30.00 grams and converting it to moles using masses from the periodic table. We learned how to do that way back in video 7. If you've forgotten how, this would be a good time to go back and review that video. It turns out that NaCl weighs 58.442 grams per mole. Since I want grams to cancel out, the 58.442 goes in the denominator, and the mole goes in the numerator. That gives me a result of 0 0.5133 moles. Notice that we have four significant figures, because that's the number of sig figs in the number we used that had the fewest sig figs in the calculation. 
Again, if you've forgotten how to decide the correct number of significant figures to put in your answer, it would be a good idea to review video number 7. Having the correct number of sig figs in your answer is always worth points on your tests, quizzes, and homework. To finish our calculation, we need to put the liters of solution in the denominator. There are 250 milliliters, so to get the liters, we need to use a conversion factor. There are 1,000 milliliters in a liter, so our conversion factor will have 1,000 milliliters on one side and one liter on the other. Since we want milliliters to cancel out, we'll put that in the denominator. We get 0 0.250 liters, and that goes in the denominator of our main equation. The result is a concentration of 2.05 m. Let's try another example. Suppose you want to make 150 milliliters of a 3.00 molar solution of potassium phosphate. You'll do this by dissolving solid potassium phosphate in water. How many grams of the potassium phosphate are you going to need? The trick here is to remember the definition of molarity that we saw before. Again, molarity is the moles of solute, which is potassium phosphate this time, divided by the liters of solution. If you look at the information we have, we know the molarity and we know the liters. Actually, we know the milliliters, but we can get liters from that pretty easily. The only thing we don't know is the moles of our solute, but we can rewrite this equation a little so that we solve for the moles. If we multiply both sides by the liters of solution, the denominator on the right cancels out, and we get this. Notice that the question asked us how many grams of potassium phosphate we need, not how many moles. But once we know the moles, we can convert that to grams pretty easily. So let's plug in the information we know into this equation. We have 150 milliliters, which is 0 0.150 liters. And we have a 3.00 molar solution. That gives us a result of 0 0.450 moles of potassium phosphate. To get grams, we'll convert that by using masses from the periodic table. It turns out that one mole of potassium phosphate weighs 212.2663 grams. Since we want moles to cancel out, the one mole goes in the denominator and the mass goes up top. We get 95.5 grams as our result, so that's how many grams of potassium phosphate we'll need in our solution. Notice that we have three sig figs in our answer, because that's how many were in the least significant number we started with. Now that we know about molarity and how to do calculations with it, it means that there are now a lot more different things that we can learn about a chemical reaction. You might remember that way back in video number 8, we talked about stoichiometry calculations, and I gave you this general guide on how to do calculations like that. First, we start with whatever data we're given. At the time, that was usually grams. Step one is to convert that to moles. Next, we convert that to moles of our target compound, the one we're trying to solve for. And finally, we convert those moles back into grams for our answer. But now that we know about molarity, we can make this even more useful. Instead of always starting and ending with grams, we can start with grams, or liters, or molarity. And we can also end with grams, liters, or molarity. The important thing is that it's still true that no matter what you start with, you still want to convert it to moles of our known compound, then convert that to moles of our target. That's always the key to getting this type of calculation right. So let's try an example. We started today by looking at acid-base reactions, so let's try a calculation with one of those. Suppose we do an experiment where we react phosphoric acid with potassium hydroxide. What volume of 2.50 molar H3PO4 would be needed to react with 30.0 milliliters of 5.00 molar KOH? We'll use the guide I gave you a moment ago to solve this problem. 
But first, you might remember that the first thing we need to do in any stoichiometry problem is balance the reaction. If we don't balance the reaction first, we'll often arrive at the wrong answer to our problem. If you look at our reaction, you'll see that it's not balanced right now. The phosphorus is balanced, but everything else isn't. As I mentioned earlier, it's hard to start by balancing elements that are in a polyatomic ion, like phosphate or hydroxide, so we'll save the hydrogen and oxygen for later. Instead, we'll start by balancing the potassium. To do that, we need a coefficient of 3 in front of the KOH. Next, we'll balance the hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen only appears in one molecule on the right, but oxygen appears in two compounds on each side of the reaction, so the hydrogen will be easier to balance. There are a total of six hydrogens on the left side and just two on the right side, so to balance it, we need a coefficient of three on the water. And now that we've done that, we find out that all the elements in the reaction are now balanced. So now we can do our calculation. We want to start with our known compound. But which one is that? We're trying to figure out the volume of H3PO4, so that must be our target compound, which means that the KOH is our known. We know the volume, and we know the molarity of the KOH. And as it says in the first box, we can start with either one of those. I'll start with the volume. Remember, we want the liters here, so we should make sure that that's the unit that we use. The question tells us that we have 30.0 milliliters. That's 0 0.030 liters. I got that by dividing the milliliters by 1,000. To save time, I usually won't write out that conversion in these videos. You should try to get used to converting milliliters to liters in your head if you can. It's a pretty quick conversion to do. Just remember to divide by 1,000, not multiply. So in the first step, we want to convert to moles of our known, the KOH. How do we do that? Well, we have liters, and we also know the molarity. The molarity tells us the number of moles in a liter, so we can use that as a conversion factor. Since we want liters to cancel, the one liter goes in the denominator, and the moles of KOH goes on the top. In the next step, we convert from moles of KOH to moles of phosphoric acid. This is where our balanced reaction comes in. The reaction shows us that one mole of phosphoric acid reacts with three moles of KOH, so that will be our conversion factor. We want the moles of KOH to cancel out, so the three will go in the denominator, and the one mole of H3PO4 will go on top. Notice that if we hadn't balanced the reaction first, we would probably have put a one on both sides of that fraction, and that would have given us a wrong answer. Finally, in our last step, we want to get our answer. The question asked us to find the volume of H3PO4 we need. Right now, our calculation so far tells us the moles of H3PO4. To convert between moles and liters, we need the molarity, which the question tells us is 2.50 moles per liter. We want moles to cancel out, so the 2.50 goes in the denominator, and the one liter goes on top. If you check the units now, you'll see that everything will cancel out except for liters of phosphoric acid, and that's what we're looking for for our answer. So we'll multiply all the numerators together and divide by all the denominators, and what we get is 0 0.0200 liters. Notice that this number has three sig figs because, as I mentioned in an earlier video, zeros at the very beginning of a number aren't significant. This is a perfectly acceptable answer, and you'd get full points for it on a test, but many people like to put their answer in milliliters instead of liters. If you decide to do that, what you'll get is 20.0 milliliters. This calculation is by far the most important one in this chapter, and you'll get plenty of practice in class and in the homework. It's definitely a calculation that you should try to become comfortable with before the next test. 
Before we finish for the day, there's one more, much easier type of calculation that we should look at. We often have a very concentrated solution of a compound, but what we want is something with a much lower molarity. In that case, we need to dilute the concentrated solution. For example, suppose we have 25.0 mils of a 6.00 molar HCl solution. But what we really want is a 0.500 molar solution. We need to dilute our 6 molar solution by adding water. But how much water should we add? To find out, we use a very simple equation. M1V1 equals M2V2. In this case, M1 and V1 are the molarity and volume of the original solution, and M2 and V2 are the molarity and volume of the solution we end up with. So in our case, we start with a 6.00 molar solution, so that's M1, and we have 25.0 milliliters of it, so that's V1. We want to get a 0.500 molar solution, so that's M2. If we solve for V2, we find out that V2 is 300 milliliters. Notice that this means that our final volume should be 300 milliliters. Since we already had 25 mils at the beginning, this means that we'll need to add 275 mils of water to bring the total to 300. Let's try one more. Suppose we need 250 mils of a 0 0.0100 molar NaCl solution. But unfortunately, all we have is a way too concentrated 2.00 molar solution. How much of the 2 molar solution will we need to start with? We'll use the same equation as last time, M1V1 equals M2V2. This time, we know what we want to end up with. We want a 0 0.0100 molar solution, so that's M2. And we want 250 milliliters of it, so that's V2. Our starting molarity is 2.00 molar, so that's M1. If we now solve for V1, we get 1.25 milliliters. So that's the volume of the 2 molar solution that we should start with. Now that we know a little about dilutions, I can finally try that experiment that I told you about at the beginning of the video, the one that might kill me, but it probably won't. Some of you might have heard of something called homeopathic medicine. This is a kind of alternative medicine, and one of the ideas behind it is that if you have a medicinal compound, it gets more potent the more you dilute it. Now, based on what we just learned about dilution, I hope you just got a confused look on your face because you just saw that when you dilute a solution, it gets weaker, not stronger. And if you thought that, you are absolutely right. Homeopathic medicine makes no sense for that reason. And to be blunt about it, it's complete BS. So I went out and bought this bottle of homeopathic medicine. This stuff is supposed to keep you awake when you're tired. If you look at the ingredient list, here's what it contains. This looks like a list of really technical stuff, but you actually know what many of these things are. They just use confusing language on the label to make it harder to understand. For example, here's natrum muriaticum. You've never heard of that, right? Well, natrum muriaticum is just an old-timey way of saying sodium chloride. So, it's just salt. Over here is kali phosphoricum. That's potassium phosphate, another compound that you already know about. What about the 6x on those two? That's where the dilution comes in. Remember, homeopathy says that things are more potent the more dilute they are, even though that's ridiculous. The 6x means that the substance has been diluted by a factor of 1 times 10 to the 6th power. In other words, it's diluted by a factor of a million. Here's another ingredient that says 12x, which means it's been diluted by a factor of 1 times 10 to the 12th, which is a trillion. And there are even a few that say 30x, which means those are diluted by 1 times 10 to the 30th power. Since you're becoming a good chemist, you already know that 
Avogadro's number is just 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. So having something diluted by a factor of 10 to the 30th means that there's probably less than one molecule of this stuff in the entire pill. In other words, these pills probably don't contain any of the stuff that says 30x. So here's the experiment I'm going to do. The bottle says you should take two of these pills for one dose. There are 50 pills in the bottle, so that's 25 doses. I'm going to take this entire bottle now. For normal medicine, that would be a dangerous thing to do, so don't do that with real medicine. Overdosing on anything is a seriously bad idea. In fact, don't even try this with homeopathic medicine unless you understand what the ingredient list is saying. In this case, I read the ingredients and understood them, so I'm pretty confident that this isn't going to hurt me. In fact, other than the salts I already mentioned, all the ingredients listed as active ingredients are so dilute in this case that they might as well not even be there. So anyway, it's almost bedtime, so I'm going to take these and see if it keeps me awake. Will I be up all night? Even worse, will I overdose on homeopathic medicine and end up in a hospital? I'll let you know in the next video if I live. Until then, have a great week.